Hi, welcome to my shop in this edition of Dubro 101. Today we're going to be talking about pull-pull systems and how to install them and what's useful about them. To start off, a few tools that you're going to need are a couple of pairs of pliers. They can be regular pliers, they can be needle nose pliers. It doesn't really much matter, but you will need two of them. Also, some sort of cutting implement will be handy, as well as a clamping mechanism for whatever control surface you're planning to put the pull-pull system onto. Really, what the clamp is going to be used for is simply to clamp the control surface in a centered position so that as we create the pull-pull lines, tie some knots, essentially, and set things up that you have the control surface stay in the center as much as possible. So to start things off, you have three different size selections for the different types of pull-pull systems that you can utilize. There's micro, 440, and heavy duty. Really, you should be selecting these based off of some experience and consulting with your uh, local flying club. My best recommendation is that you try to stick with what Dubro recommends, and that is that the uh, heavy duty pull pull system is recommended for a 40 to 91 size. You can even use this on some larger sizes too. Um, but below 40 size, I would definitely recommend the pull pull system for the 440. And then really tiny stuff, you're going to be going with the micro pull pull system just to keep things even lighter in your tail. So now I'm going to get these things unpackaged a little bit and just show you some basic differences between each of the different sizes. So I've got most of the pieces laid out here on the bench and you can see right away there's a, there's a difference in number and size primarily. But you've got essentially the, the same basic things between each of the three sets. You've got some sort of line that you're going to be using and that comes in really thin or a nylon coated metal cable. Next up is you have your actual connections and on the micro set you have these easy connectors that you would use on the servo or the control surface. Once you have those installed you'll have the cotter pins that you can use to adjust in and out for the length of the pull pull lines and that's useful because sometimes this thread on really hot days I have had this expand a little bit but it could also be my model warping a little bit in the heat as well. It's good for taking up the slack on those really hot days. The other common thing that you have on all three of these is a crimp. Now the crimps are of generally two sizes between the, uh, the two larger kits and the small kit. But if you want to have a crimping tool, that's fine. Uh, I personally don't use a crimping tool and I find that some sort of needle nose pliers or some sort of crushing thing like a pair of regular pliers, it works just as well. So aside from how the basic micro system goes together, everything is fairly self-explanatory under the cover. You have your control surface, or you have your servo control arm where you have a loop and a crimp and simply you create the loop and crush the crimp and then you use the cotter pin to adjust the length of the line. Now personally I prefer to use the cotter pin on both ends of the pull pull line. That's just my preference. Some people say that that that's a risk because potentially this could come loose. Uh, but I, ha I honestly haven't found that to be a problem. Uh, obviously doing annual checks or at least pre-flight checks to make sure that your control surfaces are not uh, loose or don't have any slack, that's useful as well. But generally that's how I use all of these systems is having these adjustable ends on both ends of the lines. So moving forward, we're going to focus on the larger size. These two kits assemble the same. The largest kit has a special control surface attachment system that will go over that so that we cover everything. The assembly of the control mechanism for the control surface on the heavy duty system is really quite straightforward. 
There's an excellent diagram on the back of the instruction manual that is quite simple. Assembling it just like this is left with, it'll look like this. And it's pretty straightforward, like I said, but what's important to note is that when you're drilling through your control surface, you have to make sure that it's completely perpendicular to your hinge line. So I did have to elevate this control surface when I drilled through it. Additionally, these washers are domed on this nut so they will conform to the angle of your control surface. It's really quite a clever design. To secure everything, this is why you need two different clamping tools because this jam nut needs to be tightened against here. You can worry about the length of these at a later time after installation. They can be cut off with a Dremel tool. I highly suggest that you try to get them as even as possible using a ruler and meaning from the center line to the hole. If you don't get this even, you can have some uh, pretty extensive slack issues. And again, I try to overcome any sort of issues in adjusting this length after the installation by having adjustability on both ends of the line. With all of these things said, let's go ahead and take a look at the connection, how to make the connection, and then we'll go over to a basic system to show you how to do everything. So essentially we start with four pieces. You have a threaded rod that has a hole on one end of it. You're going to take your jam nut and screw it on almost two-thirds or so down the threads. Then you'll take one of these short pieces of tubing and slide it over the clevis. Then screw the rod into the clevis. Then slide the tube down on and you can see roughly where the thread is coming through. I generally like to have my thread right dead even so that it's completely filling that entire hub area. And then I simply snug down the jam nut. Once you've got all four of them assembled, we're basically ready to start stringing everything. So here is our test example. I've built this specially for this example to you guys so that you can see everything that's going on all in one frame and we're not going back and forth from one end to the other of an airplane and you get confused. On one side we have the servo, we've got the two arms, it's just uh, we've got each one of the clevises that we've assembled in place as well as our control surface that is clamped in place so that it's not flexing too much. Mostly we would just want to keep it mostly center. We can fine tune the trim later by adjusting each end of the rods. There's plenty of, of this cable in your kit so I usually cut mine quite long, usually six to eight inches over the amount that I need from one point to the other. It's just an estimation, but because I've got big hands and sometimes we're working in tight spaces, when we create these, you may have to take one end off of the control surface or the control horn on your servo. So really it depends on what model you're using and how you're setting it up. But this is the basic principle. As you can see, I've already done one of our crimps here, but I'm going to demonstrate how to do the other end because that's the more difficult version. And in the end, doing the crimp is the same on each end. It's just a little more tedious when you're on the connecting end. You're going to start by taking one of your crimp tubes and putting it over the cable. It doesn't necesarily matter where it ends for now. But for us, what we really care about is just trying to get the length of, of the cable correct. It's important that when you're working on your model, that at this point you check that this end is sort of taut. I've had situations where I thought things were tight, but I had this end folded backwards. And this part was being caught on the fuselage of the airplane. 
once you have this mostly tight, this is important because this will help make sure that your line is secure as possible. You're gonna take your crimp tube and you're actually gonna feed it, the cable, up through like this. Then you will take the cable and wrap it around and feed it through that same direction, creating a loop. What I then do is I hold the end of the cable as well as the cable that's there and slide the tube into the position that I need. From there, tighten the loop to take up the slack. And you can also adjust the loop in your clevis. Tightening a little bit at a time is just fine. I generally try to have about a quarter of an inch or a centimeter of the loop before it gets to the crimp. So once you're ready to make sure that the cable is absolutely set, you can bend it a little bit and it will keep that shape. Then you can go ahead and pull your loop small and essentially do the same thing with that loop. So now you have a fairly loose, but mostly straight cable. Then it's a simple matter of doing your crimp and cutting the excess. I usually leave about half a centimeter of length on the end. Now, once everything is fine and set and done, you'll go ahead and use a one inch long piece of the shrink tubing. And you can take your entire clevis off, slide it over the threaded end and over top. You want to have the shrink tube cover just the non-threaded portion of the threaded rod. And then it'll cover over top of everything else. And that helps to prevent this from doing any damage to your model if there's any rubbing or binding. It also helps to keep things secure as well. But generally speaking, if you're pulling, you're going to be tightening here, not loosening from the pulling motion. At this point, once you have both cables connected, I highly recommend that you have a servo tester plugged in and have your servo centered as well as maintain your clamp as well. And then you can begin to tighten these lines. And you simply do by screwing them in at one end or the other, and then you tighten the jam nut. Also note that sometimes you do have to take the clevis off to take out any twist that you're putting in the line. So once you have your lines tightened, you should be able to not have any slop in your control surface or very, very little at best. From there, I highly recommend that you cycle and check for free movement. Also keep in mind that internally, you may have different areas that may need these to go to certain low or high spots, and you can use different pieces of plastic tubing for that. A coffee stirrer is a great idea for that. Now, I can't tell you everything there is to know about the geometry of setting up one of these. This is actually one of those highly debated topics in our hobby. Really what I just want to tell you is that the easiest way and simplest way to make sure that everything is set up that will keep even tension on both sides, regardless of whether it crosses over or not, is to make sure that the distance on your servo horn matches the distance on your control horn. That's really the simplest way. I'm not going to go into any further details. There are plenty of other resources out there if you want to deviate from that plan. 
Here is an example on a quarter scale Fokker I'm working on where I've used this system and I'm using a small piece of plastic tubing as a guide to go into the fuselage. This helps prevent wear and tear on the fuselage itself and you can see I've cut it flush with the surface and it's a very clean install. Once I have the model painted and all my trims are set, I simply slide these plastic tubes over top of the clevis to make sure the clevis doesn't come detached. And at that time, I can also mark on the threaded rod where I need to have it properly threaded. And I can put my piece of shrink tube on and never have to worry about this connection again. Inside the fuselage, I have a very serviceable area where I can make my adjustments as well as have access to see all of my service points to make sure everything is intact. I can do my inspection and see everything that I need to do. And I've done that intentionally because I know that this is a system that will require me to observe it at least once a year, if not more. Until next time, everyone, thank you so much for stopping by the shop. Really hope you found it useful and that you find something that you can pass along to some friends.